So this is less a typical sermon than a little bit of a history lesson. So maybe you can take away five things that you didn't know before you got here about St. James. Maybe that'll be worth your time here sitting here listening to me. Uh, but there's several James out there. So the first thing you have to do when you say, I go to St. James, uh, is figure out which James you're talking about. James, the, uh, the brother of Jesus, uh, the, uh, James the lesser, or uh, we get to be James the greater. Now, it's because he was sort of larger in size, and uh, you know, so no one's ever actually said, I get to be Ben the Greater. Uh, but James is James the Greater, uh, partly because he came first, and partly because they say he might have been a little bigger than, uh, uh, and, you know, if you're called Sons of Thunder, you probably carry a little bit of might. Uh, that was actually a name that Jesus gave to him, and we'll figure out why in a little bit. But the first story of, uh, of James, and, and he's always in, in the Bible almost up until the very end with, uh, with his brother John, James and John, uh, is, is we may be depicted in that stained glass window all the way over there on the far side of the, the side chapel. I don't know if that's Peter or Andrew or James and John. It's kind of a similar story. Uh, they were fishing with their dad, Zebedee, and Jesus comes by walking on the shore and says, uh, you know, uh, drop your nets and come with me and fish for people. Uh, they drop their nets. Zebedee's uh, chin is probably uh, at the bottom of the boat or in the water. Uh, where are you going? Uh, but they uh, were compelled by Jesus to drop what they were doing and follow. Uh, and I think they served in a similar way with that kind of passion. Uh, in fact, I think Jesus kind of had to temper or, or direct that passion a little bit uh, in the ministry of James and John. Uh, but he did call them the sons of thunder, uh, and they thought because of their uh, absolutely unfettered enthusiasm. Uh, in fact, one of the first times that it had to be maybe redirected, uh, they were heading towards Jerusalem, and uh, Jesus sent some of his uh, disciples ahead uh, and says, uh, go find out whether this might be a hospitable place for us to go. And uh, they come back and they all say, well, they don't want you there. So James and John uh, say, well, Jesus, uh, do you want us to go and make fire come from the sky and wipe out the entire town? And I'm sure Jesus had his, his, his head in his hands thinking, have they listened to anything? Anything. But you have to love their confidence that they could wipe out a whole village with fire from the skies. But, uh, but eventually it gets chanted a little, uh, channeled a little more productively. Uh, and the other stories that we have, uh, maybe not as productively in the story that we have today, and the other stories about them sort of uh, uh, trying to make sure that they are, are, are getting, get top billing or, or right below Jesus in the top billing uh, as, as the elite disciples. Uh, the left and right hand. And, and part of that may be because they do believe that they may have been first cousins of Jesus. Uh, that Salome, uh, from the, the accounts at the, at, the, at the tomb, that Salome may have been Mary's sister. Uh, and that may have thought, since we have a family in, that we might be able to be just a little bit higher on the billing. Uh, but some of the other stories, they were with Jesus at the moments that were transformative, or at least enlightening, uh, in his ministry. The transfiguration, that moment where they went up uh, the, the, the mountain, uh, and it was revealed in, in a new way that this was the fulfillment of Scripture, that this was the Messiah, this was the one that the prophets were waiting for, uh, where he is transcendently white, uh, and, and they get to be there. They also are there at that uh, most agonizing time, uh, I keep pointing that way because that's where all the good windows are about it. Uh, uh, the other panel on the opposite side uh, where Jesus is praying in Gethsemane, they were there uh, at that moment as well. Uh, so critical moments in the life of Jesus, uh, James and John uh, and, and, and Peter were, were, were there. Uh, and, uh, and there was a faithfulness. Uh, as much as they wanted to be great, I think they did hear the, uh, the words of Jesus that in order to be great, uh, you need to be willing to serve. Uh, and uh, and you need to be willing to put yourself uh, beneath the cross and carry your cross. Uh, and, and in fact, James does. He's the only disciple. We do know that others were martyred later, or we believe uh, from accounts. But he's the only one in the Acts uh, of, of the Apostles that we find out uh, is, uh, is in fact uh, killed for his faith. And some uh, argue that the reason that he probably was killed, even though that, uh, uh, you know, it says that Peter and, and Paul and others were arrested as well, uh, but maybe he had a tough time channeling that uh, thunder within and that Herod uh, didn't think he could be quelled the same way as some of the others, um, but he did. Uh, and one of the things I had, I have show and tell items, but uh, people are really good at cleaning up behind me and I left an empty coffee cup 
Uh, but I, got, I left it there because it had the St. James cross. Uh, that red cross that you see, uh, it's a sword. Uh, and uh, it, it's been misused uh, in history uh, for the Crusades, but the original reason for that cross uh, was that our crosses look different. Uh, the cross that God calls us to bear is not necessarily the literal cross that Jesus bore. And for Andrew, it was a different kind of cross. Uh, for James, it was the sword. Uh, so that it's formed into a cross because that's the cross that James was called to bear. And all of us are called to figure out what is God calling us to bear? Uh, what, is, what is our cross? What is God calling us to do uh, to be a transformative force in the world? Uh, but he was killed by, uh, by Herod of Agrippa, the, the grandson of, of, of Herod the Great, uh, in 44. The rest of the story is outside scripture and is something of legend. So uh, uh, don't hold me to the history of this, but it's some good storytelling. So sometime between uh, Jesus' death uh, death, resurrection, and ascension in the moment of Pentecost, all of that, and 44 AD, uh, they do believe that he maybe journeyed to Spain. Uh, and he's the patron saint of Spain, uh, and he uh, journeyed to Santiago uh, de Compostela, uh, and he, they believe he made three pilgrimages, and that's one of the reasons for the three different shells that are, are, are you see in the shield of St. James, often you'll see three shells. Uh, that's one of the reasons, I'll talk more about the shells. Uh, but he went there to try to spread the good news, uh, and he was pretty ineffective. Uh, he went there, he's in the people right, in the, uh, uh, right around the, the, the Mediterranean, right uh, near the Sea of Galilee were having tremendous success, uh, but he was a little farther away and uh, wasn't having the same response and he was losing faith. Uh, and supposedly at around 40 AD, he was there almost despondent, ready to return, and he had a vision. Uh, a vision from the Virgin Mary standing on a pillar uh, who said to, uh, to James not to lose heart. Uh, they still commemorate and still believe they actually have the pillar that he le she left. Uh, but she's standing on a pillar and she says, I leave you this pillar uh, because uh, your faith, the faith that you are sharing with these people, will be as firm and as sturdy and as, as, as sure a foundation as this, uh, as this pillar itself. Uh, and, and, and with that, he continues his work uh, and he uh, eventually returns to Jerusalem uh, where he's arrested uh, uh, and beheaded. Uh, but they take his body back to Spain because of the impact that he had in that community there. Uh, and the legend has it uh, that as they were taking his body back to Spain, there was uh, a, a horrific storm uh, and the ship carrying his body uh, so that it could be laid to rest uh, in Spain is, uh, is thrown off the boat uh, and um, they find the body sometime later totally preserved except that it was covered in scallop shells. And that's one of the reasons that they associate the scallop shells. Another legend is that that didn't happen, uh, <laughs> but that the boat was making its way and uh, there was a wedding taking place and the groom was on his uh, uh, horse uh, and all of a sudden the horse was so transfixed by what was taking place that he runs straight into the water uh, where the groom uh, 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 is, is, is taken into the water and the, the groom comes up uh, un, unscathed but covered with scallop shells. Uh, some argued there's just a lot of scallop shells around there and people wanted a keepsake. <laughs> Again, this isn't recorded history, this is more the legend. Uh, but I did have a wonderful parishioner who went there, uh, and it's one of the most uh, uh, visited uh, Christian sites. Uh, they said during the Middle Ages it was third to uh, Jerusalem, Rome, uh, and, and Santiago uh, de Compostela uh, uh, was the third most visited Christian site, and there was a 100-mile hike or a 200-mile uh, now bike ride uh, that people uh, uh, pilgrimage. Uh, and they say around the town, almost all the buildings have this on it. Uh, and they, they, the symbols have come to take on new meaning. Uh, at first they believed that the symbols were the two smaller shells for his missionary journeys and one larger shell because uh, he was so committed to baptism that he would baptize with the shell and pour water uh, when he was there. And uh, then they had three shells and they said, you know what we can do with three shells? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Uh, so they had the three shells. Uh, and some of the other things that they, uh, they used the shell for, because uh, it, it is a ripe image, uh, one, that God continues to, to move these shells uh, towards the shore, that God is leading all of us towards God. Uh, and as people came on the pilgrimage, that God was leading all of them uh, 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 towards the end. But also all of the lines in the, uh, in the scallop shell all come from different places. All of our journeys begin uh, in very different places, but they all are drawn together, uh, much like all of those that, that, that journeyed uh, 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 towards Santiago, that uh, they might have come from different places, different parts of their lives, but in their pilgrimage, they were all drawn together uh, towards that same place um, uh, where, where, where they believed that uh, James's bones uh, may reside. So one of the other things that they would do is that, that uh, when the people were on pilgrimage, not this one because it would get a little heavy, but a, a, a scallop shell would hang from them. It would be tied, uh, and it was a way that uh, when they were thirsty that they could go through the town, and uh, people felt like it wasn't too much to give somebody a scallop shell worth of food or a beer or of wine or of water, uh, so they would bring it as a... a, a is, is kind of a custom of, you know, we'll fill your, your, your shell for your journey. Uh, so it was a way that they were sustained along their journey. So this is one of, uh, when you look at that St. James window, I know I'm taking you on a course all the way through our church here, uh, you will notice the three shells. You w won't notice the St. James cross on that one, uh, but you will notice that either uh, the images of, uh, of James either have a pilgrim's hat because of his, uh, uh, because of his journeys uh, or a staff. That one doesn't have a hat, but it has his staff, which is a, a pilgrim's staff, uh, a, a symbol of his journey. Uh, and I, I think three things that we can take as, as people of St. James. Uh, he is our patron saint, and I hope we're influenced by his example uh, and that, that by being here together over time, uh, some of, uh, of his fervor and energy uh, sort of washes over us. But uh, I love the name Sons of Thunder. I mean, wouldn't you like to be called a son or daughter of thunder? Uh, I think by being here, we are, by the spirit of adoption, uh, sons and daughters of thunder, uh, which means that we need to have some energy and some enthusiasm for the work that we do. Uh, just like James and John, it maybe had to be rechanneled a little bit, uh, but that we would have a, a fervor, uh, a deep desire and a passion within us that when we go out and do God's work, that they're like, boy, those sons and daughters of thunder are something, aren't they? Uh, that we would go out with that kind of energy and passion. Uh, and that we might figure out what cross it is that we're called to carry. That our passion uh, might come out uh, in different ways and, and, and we might be called to different pursuits, whether it's the service of the poor, uh, whether it's the care of this earth, whatever it might be, that we would figure out what cross uh, uh, we are called to bear uh, and it would take shape in us and that we would go and we would do that with all that we have. Uh, and, um, and the third, I have to remember what my third was. I had three important points uh, as that we went out. Um, uh, one, that we would go out. Two, that we would be, uh, that we would be daughters and sons of thunder. Where's that, where's that last one? I mean, it's going to come to me. It's going to come to me. Um, uh, but I do believe that we are called to make ourselves least, that uh, it's not about us, that uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I think their lesson, and when they had their passions rechanneled, uh, that they had to realize that it's not about who they are or who they want to be, but it's about who God calls them to be. Um, and that when we let go of ourselves, when we make ourselves small, we get filled with God's spirit. So I hope that we can go out boldly into the world and claim ourselves as part of that legacy of St. James. Amen.